Now, there's this other doo-doo who actually teaches that uh, he's, he teaches something even weirder than this guy. He thinks that all of this kind of stuff was already fulfilled at the first centuries. Are you kidding me? And this guy is actually more eloquent and supposed to be more talkative of a scholar with Greek and Hebrew and does debates with atheists. And he comes up with a weirder, weirder belief than the one you just heard just now. So I don't know who's dumb and dumber, to be honest. Okay, so this guy, he teaches a view. Now remember, I've showed you, it's so essential that you watch all of our Revelation videos. Go to our playlist of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, I taught you another point of view. What is this called? Preterism. So notice that preterism or preterism, that this group, what did I teach you before? Basically, this group teaches that the so-called apocalyptic end times that we refer to as sometime in the future, they think it's already been fulfilled at the first centuries. That's why they think. So they already think that all this stuff concerning the apocalyptic events, the Antichrist and all that was referring to early Rome and then Jerusalem being falling apart, that was referring to the fall of Jerusalem around 70 AD, not referring to the future destruction of Jerusalem at the Antichrist future that we put it. So notice right here that preterism or preterism, that these guys think that all of this was already fulfilled and R.C. Sproul jumps to Acts chapter 2 on this one. So keep your hand at Revelation 6. Keep your hand at Revelation 6 and your second hand to go to Acts 2. Acts chapter 2. So R.C. Sproul, he's a famous Calvinist that MacArthur and Washer and Piper and all these other people caught up later on. So... Moeller, I think Steve Green or something like that, and all these uh, Calvinist big shots or those who are sympathetic toward Calvinists, uh, you got to realize R.C. Sproul was ahead of that time. So he's the main guy. He recently passed away. So R.C. Sproul, he, he's going to use Acts chapter 2 to match up with Revelation 6, okay? And then Durbin around Arizona is going to try to claim that, oh yeah, all this stuff was already fulfilled at the first centuries. No wonder demons are in Arizona, man. I mean, that's where you get all those UFO weird stuff, right? That secret area that the military are dealing with aliens and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, if you want to find devils, go to Arizona, man. Go to Arizona. No wonder those churches turn out to be devil-possessed, man. Yeah. They're like living in the same city with each other, those two guys. Can you imagine them bumping to each other at a grocery store? It must be funny, right? Okay, anyways, Acts chapter 2. Now, notice how this matches up with Revelation 6. Look at verse 14, uh, Acts 2, 14. Acts 2, 14. Notice how this matches with Revelation 6. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter supposedly is claiming that this event that they're doing in Acts 2 is fulfilling verse 17 by Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams." And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Look at this. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call, upon the shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, that matches Revelation 6 with this sixth seal. But supposedly, Acts 2 is showing right here that, hey, during this first century timeline, we're already seeing this fulfilling. So that's what they're going to argue. Now, a, a few of them would claim to argue that this is so weird, blood, fire, vapor of smoke and all that. They, they claim that this is the, uh, what John the Baptist prophesied, that he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
<laughs> and these are supposed to be eloquent scholars, these guys. Hilarious, man. Hilarious, man. I don't, the post, it makes the post-tribbers sound like a PhD guy compared to these preterist, preterist guys, man. You see why I have zero respect for these scholars and I slam all fours on them? They'll give you the most stupid teaching that your great-great-grandfather came from a rock. But when you cloud it with eloquent scholastic language, you get away with it. And people think you're a genius. And that ticks me off more than anything. I land you all fours on that one. Okay, so anyways, so this is what they claim. Now, let's also look at Matthew 24, Matthew 24. Thus, that chapter, Matthew 24, they're going to try to apply that to a first century timeline. So look how they do this, Matthew chapter 24. Notice that verse 29 matches with Revelation 6 about the moon turning blood, sun darkened, and then all these stars falling out of heaven. Look at verse 29. That matches, correct? When you're reading verse 29 right now? It matches, right? Okay. Now, look at verse 32 through 33. Uh, 32 and 34, excuse me. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Verse 34, verily I say unto you, what does it say? This generation shall not pass. So according to some of these Calvinist preterist dummies, they will claim that, so notice that this generation has to witness all of these events happening. See that? So that's how they go around it. Now, how do you debunk this? Well, it's pretty easy to debunk. You might say, I don't think so. It's a really good point. So they don't really read the verse, okay? You just read the whole chapter, okay? Verse 34, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, right? But look what else is passing away at verse 35. Heaven and earth shall what? Pass away. Did that happen at that generation? No. Did they pay attention to Revelation 6? I mean, look back at Revelation 6. Heaven and earth passing away, right? Now look at verse 14. And the heaven departed as a what? Scroll when it is rolled together. And what? Every mountain and what? Island were moved out of their places. What time period are you going to put that one on? We like to, some of them might say, you could probably put that the destruction of Jerusalem. No, it said islands over there. Where are the islands, man? What in the world? You know, they always come up with figurative interpret. So the only way around this is that they would try to figure it, figuratively interpret this and try to find some historical event that can match up with that. That's what they're going to be gra grasping, pieces of straws to do this. But look, that's not going to help either because look at verse 15 and 16. You know what's going on at 15 and 16? All the kings of the earth are fleeing for their lives. That did not happen at first century for crying out loud. Look at verse 16. Who are they running away from? They're running away from the what? The face of what? Jesus Christ. Did that happen at the first centuries? No. This makes a lot of sense. One of these dummies named Gary, he's all over Apologia Studios channel because Durbin thinks, man, this guy's a genius. And sci-fi fiction of the apocalypse and end times. You both are dummies. You don't even read that verse. How can you apply that to first century when all the kings of the earth are running for their lives and the islands are moved out of their place and 16 is even plainer. They're hiding from who? The face of God himself coming down. Did that ever happen at the first century? You can play figurative with 15. Uh, you can do 14 and 15, but I don't know what you're going to do with 16. 16 is the whole world running away from the face of God. I don't know how you're going to make that metaphorical, man. Besides, this is going to even be more literal. Go back to Matthew 24. This is going to be really hard to stop. Look at verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So notice, Jesus is coming down from heaven. 
But look at the next part of verse 30. And then shall what? All the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall what? See the Son of Man. See that? They're seeing him face to face. And all the tribes of the earth are seeing that, and they're mourning. Look at Zechariah. Zechariah. There is no way you can go around this. Now, some of them might argue. I'm not saying all of them do. All right? So, Calvinists, stop tearing your hair and wetting your underwear, okay, and calm down. Oh, I don't teach that. I didn't say all of you do, okay, so calm down. But some of them, they might argue that, okay, so we can admit that Jesus Christ coming down literally and there's a final resurrection, that that's going to happen at the end. But this stuff about concerning this event that you're referring to at Matthew 24, that's already happened at the first century, and then later on, Jesus Christ, he's going to come down. Wait a minute, you just made a gap over there. You just made a gap. And you accuse us for making this gap at Matthew 24 and the book of Daniel and Revelation where there was a historical application, but then later on it can jump to the future. You make fun of us for making double application on something that's historical, but it can jump to something prophetic. Look who's a hypocrite now. Whatever way you argue, you're not going to get around this. If you want to combine the coming of the Son of Man, I'm saying if, okay? Calm down. Don't throw a tantrum and do 50 videos and post me on your Facebook, okay? Calm down. If you want to combine the coming of the Son of Man uh, with the stars falling down, the moon turning to blood, the sun darkening, and then you want to apply that to a first century timeline, you really can't do that because that never happened where Jesus came down and all the earth is running away. Because look at Zechariah 12. This is bad. Verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David, Israel, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Israel. Now remember it says all the tribes of the earth mourn when they see him. Right. Tribes. This might be Israel tribes because let's keep reading. And they shall look upon me whom what? They have per pierced and they shall what? Mourn. Didn't that verse say talk about their mourning when they're seeing him? But look at verse 12, okay? This did not happen. And the land shall mourn, every family apart. The family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart. The family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. The family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Did that happen with the nation of Israel? No. So, let's be honest, this never happened before. It makes sense to put this at a future prophetic timeline. Sci-fi. This is fairy tale Cinderella story. This is even worse, man. You're making up stuff with your figurative interpretations. You notice that when we talk about this sci-fi stuff you, you accuse us with, we go by what the verse says. That's not made up, sci-fi. But I'll tell you, putting all that first century timeline and forcing those words into a figurative interpretation, you're trying too hard, and that has to be conjured up from your imagination. I told you that Cinderella story then. Okay, let's go back. But Acts 2, Peter talked about that this was a fulfillment. You know what the simple answer to that is? It's like every other prophecy and scripture that you found in the Bible with Psalms, Isaiah, the minor prophets, major prophets. They gave so many prophecies about the timeline of Israel being destroyed by Babylon, but within that same context, they gave a prophecy concerning about their coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. David, he gave, he talked about what happened historically to himself at his timeline, but then he switched himself to a form talking about Jesus the Messiah. And we looked at all those verses before, right? Which is why I argued about what? Double application, right? right. Double application, whether you like it or not, is in is undeniable, undeniable. No matter what Christian denomination or Christian doctrine you believe in, everyone has to admit there's a double application. Otherwise, you're going to have to deny all the messianic prophecies of Jesus. Right. 
because the messianic prophecies of Jesus, if you were to look at all of them, not all the verses were about Jesus the Messiah. The prophets were either talking about themselves or talking about the nation of Israel. So what are you going to do about that? See, it's undeniable, double application, double application. So there's a partial fulfillment that Peter gave at Acts chapter 2, but then the remaining application applied to a future timeline. There's your simple answer. It's the same thing when you read the Bible with the major prophets, minor prophets, the book of Psalms, and all the other prophecies. Partial prophecy fulfilled at their timeline, historical application. But a doctrinal, future, prophetic application had to be fulfilled in the future. There's your simple answer. Everyone's tearing their hair, trying to apply this to a first century timeline, and they flip a lid when we throw this off at the future. What in the world, man? These are two heresies that you want to watch out for, and apparently those same two pastors are in the same city together because why? They share the same devil together. That's why. Okay, let's go to Revelation 7. All right, Revelation chapter 7. Okay, I told you that this was going to be very important today, okay? These are two famous doctrines when you cover end times doctrine. It is the pre-wrath or post-tribulation point of view, one, or the preterist or preterism form of view. So remember that. 